like what you see here? Then be sure to subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8, a channel devoted to the history of college football. New videos drop twice a week. Click the card in the upper right corner or the link in the description to subscribe now. And now, on with our feature presentation. May 6, 1982. We're in the Pacific Northwest, as we're up at the Kingdome for this American League battle between the New York Yankees and the Seattle Mariners. And if you know this nationally televised game on USA Network more than 40 years later, in all likelihood, it's for something that someone on the Mariners did. Because this was the day that the legendary pitcher, two-time Cy Young winner, and future Hall of Famer Gaylord Perry recorded his 300th career win. In an absolute masterclass of a performance, he went the distance, going all nine innings while allowing three runs and giving the Mariners a 7-3 victory. As of today, just 24 pitchers are a member of the 300 win club, and with the way the game is going today, we might never see another pitcher hit that milestone, making Perry a part of one of the most exclusive clubs in not just baseball, but in all of sports. This performance was a heck of a way to get win number 300, and a heck of a way to become the first pitcher in nearly 20 years since early win did it back in 1963 to reach this club. However, that wasn't the only thing that happened during this game. Far from it, in fact. Because for every winning pitcher, there's a losing pitcher. And in this case, the man who took the loss was this guy right here, New York Yankees pitcher Doyle Alexander. But it wasn't just that Alexander lost this game that makes it noteworthy. Rather, it's what happened after the loss that caused a ton of drama between he and the Yankees that strained their relationship forever. And more than 40 years later, deserves to be remembered for just how bizarre it was. Alexander was a great pitcher, you don't win 194 games and make an all-star game without having the chops to be on the mound. But this was not his finest moment. Not even close. Because this is the story behind the bizarre and somewhat forgotten drama of the 1982 New York Yankees. Before I talk about the drama in question, we need some context to understand just who Doyle Alexander is and how he was doing prior to this game. The year is 1982, and the Yankees, needing some help with their rotation, following a 1981 season when they made it to the World Series, which you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner, decided to trade for San Francisco Giants ace Doyle Alexander. On paper, this room seemed to be a good one for the Yankees. Alexander was just 31 years old, so he was still in the prime of his career and he was coming off of a spectacular season in San Francisco, where he went 11-7 with an ERA of just 289. He was the number one guy of the rotation. He led the team in games started and wins, was second on the team in strikeouts, and during one game he had at the end of the season against the Chicago Cubs, in a 12-0 victory, pitched a complete game to hit shutout. Plus, he knew what it was like to play in New York, seeing as he was with the Yankees for part of the 1976 season, and pitched well there, going 10-5 with a 3.29 ERA. So this reunion should be a good one, right? Well, not quite. Whatever momentum Alexander had going into the 1982 season was evaporated, when after his first start, in a 7-2 loss to the Detroit Tigers, he allowed five burnt runs, struck out just one batter, and allow three home runs. Not great by any means, and by the end of April, even though he bounced back against the Mariners at home in his second start, he was still looking for his first win of the season. It was a bad season for the Yankees so far, as they were just 9-13, and, and Alexander wasn't exactly helping matters that much. But this battle against Perry in front of a national television audience was a chance to turn things around and to show everyone why the Yanks traded for Alexander in the first place. If he was going to regain his form that he had in 1981, then this game against the Mariners, as in, a team that had scored just seven runs in their last four games, had scored two or fewer runs in six of their last eight games, 
and was averaging just 3.6 runs per game so far, was a good time to do it. And oh man, that did not happen at all. Alexander got absolutely creamed in this outing, only lasting three innings while allowing six hits, and with the Yankees giving up five runs. In front of the over 27,000 fans at the Kingdom, Alexander laid a complete goose egg, especially in the third inning, when he allowed five hits, including two triples, and at one point had four straight batters reach base. He was inconsistent with his control, throwing three pitches into the dirt and bouncing them before they ever reached home plate. After three innings, manager Gene Michael had seen it up and he yanked Alexander in exchange for Rudy May. And you're seeing these lowlights of Alexander's performance. He just never looked comfortable out there and was delivering meatballs that most major league batters are going to make loud contact on. But surprisingly, Alexander was pretty calm and mellow about the whole situation. You see, he had been practicing deep breathing techniques and was huge on meditating, so he took it in stride and didn't exhibit any anger about being pulled and about his performance, and instead just internalized what he had. I'm just kidding, he punched a wall. Not only did he punch a dugout wall, but the punch was so bad that he broke the knuckle on the little finger of his right hand, needing surgery and needing to have a pin insert to help knit the shattered bone. Good job. You know it's bad when even your manager calls you out for your stupidity. As manager Gene Michael said on Alexander, I don't feel sorry for him at all. It was a dumb thing to do. One of the dumbest things I've ever seen. How a pitcher who's been around as long as he has can go punch a wall with his pitching hand is beyond me. We needed him. He was important in our plans, and he not only hurt himself, but he hurt us. It was just a stupid, stupid thing to do. The diagnosis was bad, as Alexander would be out six to eight weeks while his pitching hand was recovering from the injury. Alexander volunteered to forfeit a month's worth of pay in an act of remorse, but he withdrew that offer after the union, understandably, threw a fit, and instead, the Yankees just fined Alexander for his actions. So as stupid as all this was, Alexander seemed remorseful. He'd be back in a few weeks, and this would just go down as a bizarre injury that you might still remember. But if that's all that happened, then let's be honest. As crazy of a story as this already is, it wouldn't really be much of a drama. In fact, it didn't seem like there was a whole lot of drama at all. A pitcher did a stupid thing, he got called out on it, he agreed that it was stupid, and was fine, and that was that. However, as he was getting closer and closer to his return, this is where the real drama begins. You see, as part of the rehabilitation program, Alexander had to spend some time in the minors to get back up to speed and whatnot. After a long break like that, you're not just going to get thrown back into the walls right away. However, because Alexander was a major league player and was a veteran, he worked out a deal with the Yankees for this rehab stint that he would only have to pitch one game in the minors with their AAA affiliate, the Columbus Clippers. Just do one rehab start, and then you're going to get called back up to the majors. The only problem? This start went absolutely terribly. Alexander looked like a shell of what he was in 1981 and looked as bad as he looked against the Mariners. In seven innings of work against AAA guys, he struck out just one batter and gave up four earned runs. That's not at all what you want to see. His velocity was off, his control was off, and he did not look the slightest bit ready. So the Yankees wanted to have him make one more rehab star with Columbus, because he still did not look good to go. And Alexander's response to that? Screw that. You're calling me back up to the majors right now. As Alexander said, I had a meeting with both Bill Burgesh, the vice president of baseball operations, and manager Gene Michael right before I went down. And they told me to just test the hand, not to see if I was ready. Then, when I come back up here, they tell me I was supposed to be ready. They can't say I didn't do what they asked me. 
he felt that he was ready and good to go. But the Yankees thought otherwise and thought that Alexander was being defiant and disrespectful for refusing to pitch one more game in the minors. It was for his own good. As Berger said, since he was the one responsible for his injury, the least he can do at this time is to be cooperative. Pitching batting practice or facing batters in a simulated game is not the same as being an actual game competition. However, there was nothing that the Yankees could do. Alexander exercised his option to refuse the demotion and to refuse one more start. So just like that, he was back on the team and back in the rotation against the Yankees' best wishes. And in Alexander's first game back on July 8th against the Oakland A's, let's just say there was a reason why the Yankees wanted to keep him down for a little longer. Because the Yankees lost the game 6-3, and Alexander had one of the worst outings of his career, only going one to third innings while allowing five hits and five burn runs, walking two batters, and even allowing a home run. This performance was ugly with a capital U, and to say that the Yankees were furious about this would be an understatement. Because after the game, Bill Burgesh said, I talked with Mr. Steinbrenner tonight, and he was thoroughly disgusted by the whole situation. George said he's sorry he signed him. If he could trade him tomorrow, he said he would authorize me to do so. What Doyle Alexander did to his teammates in Oakland tonight was disgraceful, but typical of the selfishness of some of the modern day ball players. First of all, Alexander disabled himself, costing his teammates during the rehabilitation. Then he came back and pitched one game at Columbus, where his performance was terrible. He insisted he was ready to pitch, despite the fact that the Columbus coaches and manager, Yankees pitching coach Clyde King, and manager Gene Michael all felt that he was not. Despite numerous meetings and virtual pleadings of the front office to go to Columbus and pitch another game and get ready, he outright refused to go. Here is a man who is earning $2.2 million to pitch, and then flat out refused to get himself ready. He then goes out there and proved to the world that the coaching staff and manager were right. A lousy performance. He let his teammates down. You can't fault a man who goes out tries, and gets beat. But you can fault a man who won't listen to the advice of his coaches and then embarrasses his team and himself. It's this type of selfishness in some players that is hurting the game today. I feel sorry for Gene Michael. Alexander ought to be ashamed. And from that moment on, that bridge was pretty much burned. Alexander was cut by the Yankees in the middle of the 1983 season and famously got into some feuds with Steinbrenner, who hated his guts by this point, even going as far as saying that he refused to have Alexander out there because some of the infielders might get hurt with him on the mound. To be fair to Alexander, he turned his career around. He won 17 games and got some MVP votes with the Toronto Blue Jays in 1984, got Cy Young votes in 1985 and 1986, and in 1988, made it to the first All-Star game of his career when he pitched for the Detroit Tigers. For most of his career, Alexander was a pretty solid pitcher and was a reliable piece in the rotation, but not in the Bronx. In New York, during his second stint, he was an absolute disaster class on the mound. Between a poor outing, a punch wall, a failed minor league stint, a feud with the coaches in the front office, and another poor start, all within a span of less than two months, Alexander and the Yankees never really quite got along. Whether you take the side of Alexander in this, and that he had no obligation to do a second start in the minors, or whether you take the side of the Yankees in this, and that a second start was the least he could do after punching a wall and causing this himself, is up to you. But whatever the case, it was clear that Doyle was the anti-Frank Sinatra because he could make it just about anywhere except New York, New York. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe as it really helps the channel out a lot.
Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes at 9 p.m. Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.